For Crimo Media's Polity, I'm Sash Nimadi. Joining me today is political scientist Stephen Friedman, here to discuss his book, Prisoners of the Past. Welcome, Mr. Friedman. Thank you. Your book argues that since South Africa achieved democracy in 1994, society has both changed and stayed the same. Can you just give us more about this insight? Okay, look, the first point is it's, it's obviously not true to say that there's been no change. And I do list in the book some of the, the economic changes, which are essentially about the development of a black middle class, which, which uh, didn't start in 1994, but certainly was uh, uh, much, much strengthened by what happened in 1994. I always make the point that there are probably about uh, 5 million South Africans uh, who are with us today who would, uh, would not be alive if it wasn't for democracy. And I'm thinking about the people who are living with HIV and AIDS who would not have got the medication that they needed if we were not a democracy. So I, I, I do stress in the book that there has been change. What has not changed are, are the basic patterns. I quote a particular scholar who says, you can have political change, but if three other things don't change, then uh, a lot of things remain the same. And the three things that are stripped of the academic language are, first of all, what we value and what we don't value, I and mean, what we think is important, what we think is unimportant. So, for example, in this country, there is still an obsession about people earning a living in, in glass and concrete office blocks, whereas millions of people around the world and in this country are earning their living on street corners or in backyards. So that's the first one. The second one is the habits uh, and the practices. So uh, once again, to take an economic example in this country because of, uh, of what happened in the past, real economic activity is supposed to happen in very formal businesses, and a lot of energy is devoted to that. Uh, but once again, it doesn't actually describe the realities in which most people are living. And then thirdly, relationships. So for example, this, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a book by uh, a South African economic historian, uh, which shows that in, in the 1920s, business and government in South Africa were shouting at each other in public and cooperating in private. And here we are 100 years later and they're doing exactly the same things. So, so those are three examples. Um, but by far the most important continuity, uh, something which has not changed, is the division of the society into insiders and outsiders. And in the book, a very, it's obviously a crude uh, the division, but I think it works. Uh, I define an outsider as uh, anybody who does not earn a wage or a salary or dividends from the formal economy. Uh, so if you don't get paid at the end of the month uh, in some way or other, then, or at the end of the week, then you're uh, an outsider. Now, that doesn't mean that all the insiders are equal. Uh, if you take my definition, the insiders include the chief executives of the major banks and the ladies who clean their offices. Now, nobody would seriously argue that the two, that they're equal, but they are both insiders. Uh, and this division into insiders and outsiders doesn't only affect our economy, it affects our politics. Uh, and I, in my view, you don't understand South African politics until you realize that it's insider politics. Uh, whether you wear a red overall and claim to be a Marxist or whether you wear a blue T-shirt and claim to be a, a free market liberal, uh, basically you're all insiders. And that means that outside election time, two thirds of the population don't really take part uh, in, uh, in, in day to day political activity. So, uh, yeah, you know, the, 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 the book was written partly to debate with precisely, and that's why your question is such a good one, to debate, to debate precisely with those people who say nothing has changed, but also with those people who say, well, we fixed all the problems in 1994, uh, and then some bad people came along and, 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 and made it all go wrong. And of course, my argument is that we didn't fix all the problems in 1994. We only fixed one problem in 1994. It was a very, very important problem, which is that 90% of the population did not have basic citizenship rights. Uh, but, uh, you know, as the academic work I mentioned shows, 
if you fix that, that doesn't mean you fixed everything else. One of the other examples you give in the book is that black professionals are among the angriest of South Africans. So briefly just tell us why you say this. Because in a nutshell, they find themselves in a situation where they have qualifications and opportunities which their parents and grandparents didn't have, but they believe that they encounter the same racial attitudes that their parents and grandparents didn't have. So on the one hand, uh, you, you know, people are, are getting qualifications, they are upwardly mobile, uh, but they believe that uh, their, their merits and their qualifications are not really valued because, uh, uh, because they're black, to be quite frank. I believe, as I argue in the book, I believe that there's, uh, there's a lot of evidence to support them. That doesn't mean that, you know, business in South Africa is packed with, with, with nasty, crazed racists. So, it simply means the point I made earlier on that you don't change uh, 200 years of behavior simply by adopting a new constitution. All sorts of uh, habits and patterns and beliefs continue. Um, so, you know, I think it is true to say that, you know, and you only have to read the financial media to, to, to confirm this, that, uh, you know, there is a fairly deep rooted belief that black people aren't really terribly competent and that you can't really leave them in charge of anything important. Uh, and that if you employ them in a corporation, uh, mostly what you want them to do is talk to other black people. I mean, I tell the story, I don't tell the story in the book, but it just illustrates that. I mean, I remember making this argument some years ago at, at, at a mining company and, and one of the executives agreed with me. And he said, look, the people you're talking to at the moment uh, are the industrial relations people because we were sitting in a room where uh, about half the people in the room were black. Uh, he said, but if you go down the corridor uh, to the personnel function, to the human resources function, uh, you know, there's one black person there and, 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 and 40 white people. That's my point. Uh, and, and, and it was a very good example that he raised because why were all the black people in industrial relations? Because they could talk to other black people in the trade union movement or in government. Uh, why were they not in, in, in human resources? Because they weren't considered competent enough to, to get the best out of the company's employees. Now, your book also points out that while government did provide relief, such as basic services, to many more people since 94, the problem was that the formal economy bred inequality. Briefly unpack these economic linkages. Well, the, 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 the formal economy, obviously, you know, the formal economy is highly concentrated. I mean, we know this. Just as, some, as an indication, I mean, in, in, in the last 10 years of apartheid, uh, it was repeatedly said that, if I can't remember, with five or six corporations controlled 90% of the assets on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Well, today, 80% of the assets on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange are controlled by 20 companies. So I suppose you could say, well, in 27 years, it's no longer six, it's 20, and it's gone from 90% to 80%. But I mean, you can't really call that a competitive economy if 20 companies control 80% of the assets. So, you know, there are huge barriers to entry, as we say. Uh, you know, I remember listening to the inaugural lecture of, of a colleague of mine at UJ, who at that stage was running a center on competition policy. And the theme of the lecture was uh, he imagined a young person in a township uh, who invented a soft drink, which uh, all his friends thought was a very fine tasting soft drink, etc. The rest of the lecture describes this young person's attempt to actually get into the marketplace. Uh, and the end of the story is they don't get into the marketplace because, you know, there are all sorts of large players who can make sure that they get squeezed out. It doesn't matter how good their product is. Um, so, you know, we, we, we are heavily skewed towards, towards large corporates. Relationships that I talked about are still there. They're also there within the economy. That means that, you know, the insiders find it very, the outsiders find it very difficult to get in. And the other reason the outsiders find it very difficult to get in is that when we talk about policy in this country, it's very much about the insider view of politi policy. Um, I mean, I argue, incidentally, in the book that, that one of the reasons why we are in this position, by no means not the only one, is that 
the black political leadership in this country, which, which, which dominates government and the white political leadership, which still largely dominates the economy and the professions, agree on one thing, uh, which they never talk about, where they never say it quite as openly as that. But if you look at their attitudes and what they do, uh, it confirms that. And that is that what we've been trying to do since 1994 is what I call white privilege for everyone. By that I mean that the, you know, if you take the way white people lived under apartheid, that is supposed to be the model for the entire society. And, and it's clearly not a viable model. You don't, you know, you don't base uh, you know, what you try to achieve in a society on what 10% of the population was able to do by using laws and, and police uh, to suppress the other 90%. But that is the reality. And so that, uh, you know, we don't have a discussion about uh, how to really include the outsiders, uh, because it's assumed that the only way you can include the outsiders uh, is to make them live like white people did in the 1960s, which is clearly not possible. And just to illustrate that, I mean, I think there's no crueler fantasy in South Africa today than what is, gets called the jobs debate. Uh, and by that, I mean that, you know, every political party or interest group uh, right, left and centre uh, has some, uh, you know, it tells you that if we just did what they told us to do, we'd create 8 million jobs or 6 million jobs or 10 million jobs, whatever the case may be. And it's all fantasy. Uh, if you look around the world today, the kind of jo millions of jobs they say are, being, are supposed to be created are being extinguished all over the world. I mean, the debate is about whether new types of jobs are going to start emerging, which, which uh, uh, compensate for that. And so we never have the conversation about what we ought to have the conversation about, which is that given that uh, uh, so many people are not going to be able to earn their living by in a glass and concrete shop or, 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 or office block, uh, what do we need to do as a society to, to enable them to earn decent livelihoods and uh, participate in the economy and put food on the table for their family? But you can't have that conversation if uh, it's all about, you know, how you're going to make all those backyard panel beaters in townships, etc., uh, you know, into, into people who have, uh, you know, who have uh, businesses in the northern suburbs of Johannesburg. You use the term path dependence in your book. Can you briefly tell our viewers what path dependence is and how does it apply to South Africa? Yeah, well, path dependence is, by, you know, it was developed by, I mean, it, it originated with a couple of not very famous uh, academics who were interested in, uh, in, in, in simply in business, in, in, in how uh, what they considered to be uh, irrational behaviour in business continued from, uh, you know, which which didn't maximise profits for shareholders, continued from generation to generation. And they came up with this, this idea that there were factors which meant that you could continue on a particular course, uh, even if uh, all the circumstances suggested that uh, you should change. And this was developed by an American uh, economic historian called Douglas North, who won the Nobel Prize for it. And essentially what North used it to, to do was to try to understand how uh, economies or societies which had gone through huge political changes uh, simply continued to perform economically in exactly the same way as they had before the political change. And that is where he developed the idea that it was all about institutions. And then and all this sounds terribly academic, but I mean, an institution is, is precisely what I was talking about earlier. It's, it's our patterns of behavior. It's, it's, it's what's considered important, what's considered not important. Uh, I mean, we're sitting here talking a few days after the State of the Nation address, and in the State of the Nation address, the president talked about uh, his encounter with uh, the eyewitness story of a, a lady who was selling goods on a street corner and was uh, hauled off to jail because she didn't have the right permit. That's an institution. We, we, if we consider that people who are trading on street corners need permits, that is an institution. Uh, and so Douglas North said, well, you know, unless your institutions change, nothing else will change. Uh, and don't believe that simply because your political rules have changed, uh, everything else will change. And, and that is the reality we do sit with. Uh, and I, I've tried to describe it. So, so we are path dependent in the sense, I mean, this idea that I mentioned earlier, that we're trying to create apartheid South Africa for everyone, 
You know, they can't get much more path dependent than that. Uh, and in fact, if you look at, yeah, you know, one of the points I make in the book is just to show you how deep the path dependence go. You could see the change in 1994 uh, as actually going back to South Africa before 1948. Uh, because before 1948, it was still minority rule, uh, but it was very oriented towards Western Europe, in particular Britain. Uh, we were a British colony and the government was very pro-British, etc. Uh, and then the Afrikaner nationalists came, they came along and they were also in favour of minority rule, but they claimed that they were very different. They weren't really, but, but they claimed that. Uh, and, you know, we're now in a situation in which, you know, everybody has the vote, we have majority rule, etc. Uh, but our standards of what is important and what is not important are, are still very firmly fixed on the West. It may not be purely England, which it was then, but certainly, you know, Britain, America. You know, it gets back to your, your earlier question. I mean, a path-dependent society is not a society in which everything may remain the same. There's no such society. But it's a society in which you think you've changed uh, a great deal and find out that, you know, you haven't changed the basic patterns in your economy and in your politics and in your, in your institution. And Mr. Friedman, can you talk to us about how politics becomes a career option for some people because of economic exclusion? Look, uh, there is a chapter in the book on corruption, um, uh, which argues, not surprisingly, given the theme of the book, that corruption today is is a side of path dependence of it because it actually repeats patterns which have been going on for years. I mean, incidentally, I, I, I cite one of my colleagues in the book, uh, the first recorded instance of, of state capture in, in South Africa was in the early 19th century uh, in, in, in the Cape Colony uh, under British rule. You know, so, so all of these patterns are, are not new. Uh, but to talk specifically about the corruption we see and the way in which path dependence uh, uh, affects that. I've described in, 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 in some detail that we still have an economy divided between outsiders and insiders. Uh, and, and if you're an outsider, you know, it's not, you know, very few of you are going to be able to take the, the path in life, which, which the textbooks tell you you ought to take, which is that you you know, find a, a nice private sector employer to, 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 to work for, or you market your ideas on, on, on uh, in the marketplace and you, you um, climb up the ladder that way. Uh, and so that people tend, some people who are able to, tend to see politics as a substitute. Uh, I mean, people are not going into politics per se. I mean, I'm sure they don't mind that, but, but you know, primarily because they want the, the status that goes with it and the esteem which they have will go with it. They're going into it as a route into the middle class. Uh, we are a market economy. People are supposed to want to be uh, in the middle class. They're supposed to want routes into the middle class. And they don't have any in the, in the private sector. So they have to look at the public sector. Uh, and, you know, I often try to illustrate this by saying that if you want to understand local government in this country in many parts of South Africa, you have to understand that the difference between being a councillor and losing your seat is the difference between being middle class and poor. You know, people who are in that position are not going to wake up every morning and say, uh, you know, how do, I, how do I make sure that my constituents are happy? Uh, they're going to wake up every morning saying, well, you know, besides anything else, how do I convince the people who are going to decide on the next party list that I should be on it? Um, secondly, uh, relying on the, the very, the very important work of my colleague Carl van Holt, um, I, I, I endorse his idea that uh, it's what he calls class formation. Uh, and what he means by that is, if you look at the history of this country, uh, originally, uh, well, certainly going back to uh, the last uh, 120, 130 years. So originally we were a British colony and British or English speaking business uh, controlled the economy. Uh, the famous Rand Lords who developed the mines, etc. Uh, in 1948, uh, Afrikaner nationalism won an election and uh, increasingly, I mean, it wasn't that the English speakers went away, you had 
uh, the emergence of Afrikaans business. You had the Sunlums and the General Minings and those large corporations which were Afrikaans. Uh, you know, there hasn't been that kind of process now. Uh, the fact that, you know, we now have majority rule, uh, you know, there's all sorts of, uh, you know, stuff about uh, uh, fat cats, etc. But I mean, there are no huge black owned conglomerates. Uh, and none of the, you know, the particular individuals like Patrice Mozepe, who, uh, you know, made a made a large amount of money on the mines. Uh, but uh, you know, where are the black sunlums? Where are the black general minings? They they, they don't exist. Uh, and therefore, once again, you use the state. You use the state to try to develop those resources. Uh, some years ago, I. Taught a course at a, at a at a at a school, a business school, uh, which was, I mean, for people who were really this is a course for people who were really in employment, uh, and uh, you know, given the demographics of the country, uh, you know, I think ninety percent of the the class was black, ninety ninety five percent, and we always used to joke about how uh, the student parking was was one level down from the the faculty park. And uh, the student parking was just full of <laughs> BMWs, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the staff parking was full of uh, much smaller cars. But the point of the story is that if you actually look at the profile, and I know because I was teaching them, 90 or 95% of the black students who were able to afford those BMWs were employed in the public sector. So in other words, that was the sort of fruits of public sector employment. Uh, and this was a private colleague. So, you know, the faculty, in a sense, were, you know, their small cars were, were, were what you got from the private sector in this particular activity. The big cars were, if you were black, you know, the only way you were going to get those big cars was from them. I mean, obviously, if you managed to get into a corporation, they'll give you one of those cars, but not, uh, it wasn't open to you. So I think it does illustrate the point that I'm making that the public sector has become a substitute for the private sector in that sense. Um, and uh, that's why people um, cling on to, on to jobs. That's why uh, they will do whatever they can to remain the mayor or the councillor or whatever the case may be. And it may always also be why South Africa had horrendous violence in, 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 in the middle of last year. Uh, because uh, I believe, uh, and based on I think quite a lot of evidence, uh, that the reason for that violence was that people in those networks, uh, which are both within the security cluster and within local government, uh, were frightened by former President Zuma's arrest because they thought that meant that their networks were going to be closed down. And so they mobilized horrendous violence in order to protect their networks. So, so that is how important it is to people because it's... Uh, it's essentially their lifeline into the middle class. That was author Stephen Friedman discussing his book, Prisoners of the Past.